My name is Rob McGinnis. Today I'm going to talk about uh, global water scarcity. Actually, I described the problem. I really should talk about uh, the solution. I want to talk about having all the water we need. Uh, this is something I've been working on for a very long time, about 16 years now. Um, and I'm really excited to talk to you about it, and thank you for inviting me here today. Uh, it's been really a pleasure meeting you so far. Um, global water scarcity is not something I think I have to spend a lot of time explaining or demonstrating or proving to anyone here. Uh, it's already upon us. There are competing demands for the water resources we have, and by water I mean fresh water, water you can put on crops, right, agricultural uses, water you can drink or use for sanitation, say in cities or, or villages, water for making things uh, like in industry and manufacturing. Water is made in everything, uh, every, part of everything we make. Uh, this is already upon us and it's getting worse. Um, water is already scarce, but uh, in 18 years it's projected we'll have 40 percent less water than we actually need. That's just a phenomenal number, 40% less. How is that even possible? Well, this is why um, the population growth of the planet is a hockey stick, especially in the last 50 or 60 years. But it's actually not just population growth, not just people drinking water that's causing most of the demand increase for water. It's actually economic activity. It's growing food, but also eating more meat, right? It requires more crops to make meat to eat, um, but also GDP growth. So if you can see in the graph uh, to my right, there's the dark blue uh, section is actually the water demand increase from GDP growth because water is part of everything we make. And one example, and there are many, if you make a pair of blue jeans, it takes 2,900 gallons of water, right? And that's true for cars and microchips and everything else. Um, and also power generation, the famed water energy nexus. If you want to make a megawatt hour of electricity using a coal plant, it takes 50,000 gallons of water to do that. If you want to use nuclear, it takes 60,000 gallons. Um, biofuel, often it takes 67,000 gallons. Uh, a conversation I've had here today tell me that that's improving. I, I hope that's true. So it's a big problem. Um, and in fact, we're not going to be able to meet our needs, this 40% gap, just by conserving, by fixing pipes, or just by using less. I mean, we certainly need to do those things. But I think the, the answer is actually to, uh, to have more water, because water uh, equals prosperity. So on the, on the left is the graph, uh, or the picture I showed you before. This is actually agricultural land in Texas. On the right is a desert in Jordan. So what's the only difference between these two places? Obviously, you'd think the soil would be better in an agricultural land. The only difference is water. On the right, they desalinated water to grow crops. So if you have water, you can turn even desert into agriculturally productive land. And that's a tremendous value difference. Water uh, not only promotes sanitation, health, uh, well-being, increases standard of living, but it also creates prosperity. So I, I argue we should be able to have more. Uh, what's the moonshot? The moonshot is to do that without destroying the planet, uh, without making things worse. So where is the water going to come from? Well, salt water is abundant. Fresh water is what we talk about when we say water scarcity. But we've got lots of water around us, right? You see the population density map on the right bottom. Um, we're largely near coasts, right? So uh, depending on how far away you want to define it, 40 to 60 percent of the population is within, say, 200 to 400 kilometers of a coastline. You can certainly desalinate seawater. But it's also true, if you look at the top, that graph isn't uh, very easy to read, but it's saline water resources here in the Central Valley. Anytime you put irrigation water on land, you create brackish water drainage. So the water is taken up by the plant, by, uh, by, uh, and, and it's used, but also transpiration occurs in the plant, evaporation, uh, soil contributes uh, salinity to that water, it goes in the bottom. And often, a water district, say in California, in Texas, or anywhere in the world, will have to not only source water, put it on the land, but also manage brackish drainage and find something to do with it. And often what it ends up doing is it ends up going to some piece of land that becomes more and more saline. And so, okay, pretty soon we're going to start growing pistachios or something else that's salt tolerant. Before you know it, you have to retire the land. And what was the one way the Romans destroyed an enemy forever? They salted the earth. And we're doing that to our own cropland. So that's obviously not a solution, but salt water is everywhere. If we could find some way to use this as a resource, wouldn't that be a way to approach that moonshot of having all the water we need? But you can't do it using current desalination methods, right? You can't use fossil fuels to desalinate water. This is a graph showing the IPCC uh, projections for water redistribution from climate change, right? So the orange and the yellow sections, these are areas that are going to get less water. And the blue sections are going to get more water. Well, the blue sections are not necessarily much better off flooding, uh, erosion of soil. It's not a great situation. Uh, and of course, the water scarcity gets worse. So if you burn fossil fuels, uh, to desalinate water, you exacerbate climate change and make it more arid, it's a vicious cycle. And in fact, you know, the, the very first time I started working on this or started caring about this, I was a young guy in the Persian Gulf War and I was a Navy diver and I was sitting in a little black rubber boat with two other guys. 
with my dive gear on, and I saw this enormous plant on the coast. And I said, what is that thing? What does that thing do? And the guy next to me said, well, that's where they desalinate water, man. They, they, they put oil in one end, and they have water come out the other end, and they drink it. And this is crazy. Why would you do that? And I decided then I would fix that problem. I would solve it somehow. So I've been working on it ever since. Um, and I think the answer to desalinating without having that oil in and water out solution is to use heat. Right? Heat is all around us. It's quite abundant. And the sources don't necessarily involve burning fossil fuels. So on the bottom right is a geothermal map. So obviously that's a really easy one. On the top right is solar thermal. I think this is one that you can do very inexpensively, particularly in distributed systems. Right? We're talking about the kind of heat that heats the hot water in your house, not uh, concentrated solar thermal with a tower or some sort of tracking uh, you know, parabolic. This is just you can roll out a black mat with tubes in it, and it gets hot. And the top left shows the, uh, the total energy use, say, in the, in the energy system of the United States. And the bottom right is all the arrows that go to electricity or the sort of the things we get from the fuel we consume. But the big fat arrow on the top left is the waste heat, often two-thirds, right? So if you could use that without burning any more fossil fuels, well, then you'd start to actually have a way to desalinate water without making the world worse. You'd make it better, and you could start to have all the water you need. So this is how we've tried to do that in the past. We tried to boil water, right? So this is the oldest form of desalination. We take water from the ocean. We put it into some sort of vessel. We burn something underneath it. It turned the water from liquid into gas. Well, any chemical engineers here know that that's a tremendous amount of energy, the enthalpy of vaporization of water from liquid to gas, because the surface tension of water doesn't like to be gas. And then we cool it, and it turns back into water again, and we leave the salts behind. This is not the way to do it. It uses a tremendous amount of heat, and it usually has to have that heat at a pretty high temperature where it could do other work. It could make electricity or it could do other things for us. All right, so now to explain how I've been trying to approach this technical breakthrough, I'm going to use a YouTube osmometer. Anyone recognizes this? It has a membrane in the middle. Uh, this membrane is special in that it allows water to pass through, but not salt. Right, we have membranes like this, and in fact, we've made some that are quite advanced. Now, normally what happens, you have uh, a brackish water on, on one side, or seawater, brackish water, or fresh water on the other, and what happens is just osmosis. The natural tendency of the water is to go from the fresh water to the saline water. Now, there are a lot of ways to think about this. No one will ever give you a good definitive answer on what osmosis is. But the way I like to think about it is that those salt molecules want to expand in the universe. They want to exercise their internal um, purpose for entropy. Right? And the ones in the fresh water want to do that too, but there's a lot less of them. And the only thing keeping one or the other where they are is the water. So the water goes where the salts want to expand. That's how I like to think about it. Don't ask me to prove it mathematically because it can't be done. Now, if you exert hydraulic pressure on the salt water, you can actually prevent this flow of water from occurring. And this is really odd if you think about it, because you can, uh, this is what you do when you do reverse osmosis. You exceed the hydraulic, you exceed the osmotic pressure with more hydraulic pressure. So now, what, what's happened is you've taken uh, some sort of fuel source, or some sort of, say, renewable like wind power that could have displaced coal for electricity, and you have created work to create pressure to counteract this osmotic pressure. And somehow these things are equivalent, they're interchangeable, which is fascinating. Uh, but this is no way to desalinate water because it requires that high value electricity or that shaft work, which you can use for transportation, heating, cooling, so many other purposes. So what have I done? Uh, I've started trying to think about how to use osmosis in a different way. And so what I decided to do is I would make my own salty solution. And this is called a draw solution because no work goes into this system. It's just osmosis. But this draw solution is salts that I chose. They're special salts. Um, they're very, very concentrated. They create a very high osmotic pressure. And the tendency of this uh, water is to go into the draw solution, even when that feed solution is three, four times the salinity of seawater. That can cause this flow to occur very rapidly in a very small, inexpensive system. Well, great. So now you've got salty water again. It's, it's a little more salty. How is that better? What's better is that these special salts can be removed in a special way. So if you put ammonia and carbon dioxide into water, they form salts. They form ammonium bicarbonate. Right? You can actually use that to bake cookies instead of sodium bicarbonate. People use it to make gingerbread cookies. Pretty cool. Um, ammonium carbonate and ammonium carbamate, for instance. And these are great salts for creating osmotic pressure. They're highly soluble, 10 molar, 12 molar, right? They bounce off that membrane just like sodium chloride does. But what's really cool about them, the thing that really makes all of this explode the possibility, is when you heat them, they come out of solution. It's gases. So now you're putting heat into a system not to change liquid water into steam, but to turn salts into gases. Well, that's cool. And when you cool them off again, they turn back into salts again, and you keep using them over and over again. And now we've got a way to take very low temperature very uh, low quality and very little thermal energy and create osmotic pressure and create hydraulic pressure to create power or to create separation. And we're talking about very, very low uh, quality energy and that matters. Um, a megajoule 
It's not a megajoule when you're talking about work. If you think about a car no engine, anyone studies the physics of turning uh, heat into work, um, the heat in, in a coffee cup is not the same as the heat coming out of a rocket engine, right? One megajoule or one kilowatt or one megawatt or whatever you want to say, there's not a megawatt in a coffee cup, but go with me there. Um, you can put a Stirling engine in a coffee cup and you can make it spin around. It's pretty cool. It made a little breeze, right? But it's not going to do very much work. But that same, say, kilowatt, fair enough, um, out of that rocket engine, you could probably harness that to do something useful, right? So it's not about using less kilowatts or megajoules. It's about using the ones that don't have any fuel associated with them. It's using the ones that don't change the, uh, the climate change equation and have very, very low cost. So it's not to use less energy, although we do. Obviously, it's less energy to turn salt into gases than it is to turn water into steam. But it's generally to use less energy resources, less electricity, less fuel. Big difference here. So I want to use the kind of energy that comes out of a hot cup of coffee in a room, not the kind that comes out of the back of a rocket engine. So I want to digress a little bit into some uh, technical details. I understand people like that uh, here especially. And we had to do, the very first thing I had to do when I formed a company to commercialize this is to make a special membrane. So membranes exist for reverse osmosis where you take the hydraulic pressure and you push the water through the membrane, but they're built um, like civil engineering projects. They're designed to withstand hydraulic pressure. So they're thick and they're very durable. Um, but we needed to make one that was nice and loose, more like a cell of a membrane, right? So it's only diffusion and osmosis that causes water to flow through. So the left bottom, you see that's a cross-section, an SEM, um, but this is a schematic representation. You see you've got an active layer that's about 100 nanometers thick. This is a polyamide layer formed by interfacial polymerization. It's just very thin polyamide. That's where all the work gets done. The water goes through it by solution diffusion. The salts, they don't like to go through it. They bounce off 99.5% rejected. Um, and a porous support because a 100 nanometer thin film, you know, in a, something you have to handle and slide in and out of tubes and like, carry on trucks, it needs to be a little more robust. So you make that of a porous material and you can see in that picture there, you've got a very thin layer, spongy, macrovoids, paper underneath. That's what you see in that SEM. So what's happening, you've got feed flowing on one side, the active layer, draw off a solution flowing on the other, um, and you've got water going through, but the salts, they're bouncing off, right? So this creates a concentration polarization. The salts are more concentrated towards the surface. Now salts are trying to come in, the draw solution salts are trying to come in and do their job, bring that water across, um, but they're being pulled away by the water the whole time. Right? These are classic uh, phenomena inside actual systems. Um, and so you get this concentration polarization profile. And so instead of having this big difference in osmotic pressure of the um, pi uh, at the top and the pi at the bottom, you end up with a very small difference. So you have this huge driving force and this tiny driving force. And it's all because the memory is just getting in the way. And so, that, that, so the very first thing we had to do when we formed the company is four guys spent one year <laughs> making the most fantastic membrane for osmosis that's ever existed. The, the membranes that were available to us when we started could do one gallon of water per square foot of membrane area per day, one GFD, and these can do 20 GFD in the same environment. No energy input whatsoever, just osmosis. Amazing. They have a lot of applications. So this is the process overall. You can see you can make it out of uh, open tanks, right? It's not pressurized inexpensive plastics, and the idea is the water comes in, very nasty water. We're talking about things that people have done with osmotic separation systems like this. Um, uh, landfill leachate, anaerobic dinitrocentrate, um, orange juice pulp, which doesn't sound that bad because it's tasty, but it's bad for membranes usually. Um, and the membrane is very robust for it because it, there's no hydraulic pressure pushing all the stuff against the membrane. It just sloughs away, keeps itself clean. On the other side, we have our draw solution circulating, and then what do we do to keep it all going? Just put a little heat in the bottom. So you can use this to generate power. We call it an osmotic heat engine. That's not what I'm talking about today, although if you want to ask me about it, I'd love to tell you about it. Um, but we use this for water separation, because out of the bottom of that, of that separation device, that thermal device on the right, comes fresh water. Because we didn't have to change the water from liquid to steam and into liquid again. It was liquid the whole time. We just traded one salt for another and then evaporated the salts, and we use them over and over again. So that's the process overall. So what have we done with this so far? We're at kind of at an interesting point today. One of the reasons that it's exciting to talk to you about it is because I've already gone through the process of um, uh, thinking about it, inventing it, uh, forming a company, uh, and creating a pilot and finishing the pilot. So we finished a pilot, and we, uh, we, what we did was we did what's called a pivot. We went to we talked about seawater desalination initially, but we also said we need to do something valuable fast. Right? This is a company after all. So we're, we've proven that we can treat very, very difficult waters, industrial waters. So on, on, the, uh, on the left there, the raw feed, that's the water from hydraulic fracturing, the Marcellus Shale. Anyone read about fracking? This is the worst water you can get. Two, three times the salinity of seawater, a lot of sand, a lot of bacteria, um, a lot of uh, oil, grease, uh, and we turn into water that is better than what you get out of tap here, likely. Over 80,000 gallons of it. And fantastic economics, very inexpensive uh, equipment, very, very low energy utilization, um, great economics. So it's great for the company, but it's just a start, right? It's not solving the world. It's not a moonshot. It's a cool business. It's not a moonshot. 
That's my last slide. <laughs> so that what, what the moonshot is to use this technology platform and to do all the other things that have to be done, which is to go and take seawater and provide it to cities as much as you need, right? But not to do that without burning fossil fuels or emitting carbon dioxide or make the planet worse. Take the water from the cities that's already been used, but it's still good, and maybe clean it and put it on crops. And then recycle water in that you irrigation, brackish water, drainage, irrigation, control the salinity of the soil, reclaim salinified soil, control the soil absorption ratio, uh, control fertilizer application, and close the loop and have all the water we need. So this hasn't been done yet, but the technology platform, I'm telling you, can do it. And so this is what I want to work on next. Thank you. Let us define X. X is a solution, a solution to a seemingly insurmountable problem, like climate change or cancer, one that affects the world. But what if we redefine X as a challenge, an opportunity for radical thinking, a chance to light up the world with breakthrough ideas and cutting edge technology, the stuff of science fiction that just might fly after all. Solving for X requires wonder and imagination and the vision to build seemingly impossible solutions to the world's biggest problems. Solve for X. Moonshot thinking.